Hi, and welcome to lecture 23 on concavity and the second derivative test. Let's begin this lecture with a definition of what it means to be concave up and concave down. So, definition is if the graph of f of x lies above all its tangent lines on an interval, some interval will just say it's i, then f of x is concave upward on that interval i. So if you're drawing tangent lines to the curve and the graph is above every time, then we're concave up. And a similar thing can be said for concave down. So if, and this will be very similar, if f of x lies below its tangent lines um, on some interval i, so I won't rewrite the whole thing, we say f of x is concave downward, and that's our other definition. So I'll underline that. All right, I'll draw an example. So if the words don't make sense, the visual will hopefully make more sense. So draw something like this on your paper. It doesn't have to be the same thing. But here we have some kind of cubic graph. If you notice, if I draw a tangent line, right here. Maybe I'll use a different color for this as well. So let me switch to this color here. So if you draw a tangent line right here on the curve, so remember tangent just touches the graph in one, at one point, this tangent line is above the graph. If you look on either direction here, we're always going to be above the graph right here. So this would be an instance where we're concave down. Remember, concave downward here means that the tangent lines, um, if f of x lies below the tangent line, then we're at concave downward. So this graph is below the tangent line here. And if I draw maybe a tangent line right here, so the, the pink lines are the tangent lines, then this one is concave up. And that's because the graph um, lies above the tangent line. Um, you can think about this as tangent lines, and that kind of helps you see what's going on. Another way I kind of view it as is if you took a section of the graph, and if you imagined filling it with water, which, and you put the water on top of a graph, which ones would the water run out, and which ones would the water stay in? So if you're in this section of the graph right here, and you were to make like this cupping here, you would see that it would fill with water, so that's concave up. It's facing up here. And if you were to try to fill this, portion with water, the water would actually just run off the graph. So it's cupping downward. So um, that's also concave down. So that's one way to look at it. I look at it as like cups, basically like cupping shapes. Um, but this tangent line um, equation works as well. OK, so how do we test for concavity? Well, here is the test for concavity that we're going to use. So if f double prime of x is positive on some interval i, then f of x is concave upward. And then the other version of this is if f double prime is less than 0 on some interval i, then f of x is concave downward. And that's it. So for us, it's going to be um, the process of computing the second derivative for a given function, and then we're going to find all the x values that make it positive or negative. The first derivative tells you increasing, decreasing. Um, so the second derivative tells you something about the shape um, and how the, gra the graph looks um, like that. So let's do an actual example, just so we can practice doing this. So down here, we're going to do the following example. We're going to look at this. 
So determine the intervals where f of x equal to x cubed minus 12x plus 1 is concave upward and concave concave downward. OK, so this is a polynomial function. Um, it's an x cubed graph, and it's positive. So it looks very similar to that one I have over there. It'll have some kind of shape like that, where you have a tail up and a tail down. So let's compute the second derivative, because that's how we find out whether something's concave up or down. So let's take the second derivative. To do that, I'm going to take the first derivative first. So the first derivative of this is 3x squared minus 12. And if I continue to the second derivative, you get 6x. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to first set this equal to 0. So I'm going to say 6x is equal to 0, which means x is equal to 0. So at x equals 0, the second derivative is 0. And now we're going to test around that spot to find out where we're positive or negative. So let's look at this. Our test value here is just going to be 0, because that's where the second derivative is 0. Now we're going to test things into the second derivative. So test in the second derivative derivative. So we're going to plug in our test values in there. We could test something like 1, and we could also test negative 1. So if you plug in 1 into the, deriv or the second derivative, you get 6 times 1 is a positive number. It's 6. And then here, if you plug in negative 1, you get a negative number. So what does that mean? It just means we are concave downward from negative infinity to negative 1, or sorry, to 0. Negative 1 was the test value we used for the interval, but the whole interval goes from negative infinity to 0. And we're concave upward from 0 to infinity, because we got a positive when we tested it into the second derivative. However, I should ask the question, what happened? at x equals 0, right? It went from being concave down to concave up. So what's going on at x equals 0? And that's going to lead us to our next definition here. So the definition is if the sine of f double prime changes at x equals c, then we have an inflection point. So that's the, the definition. That's what we're defining here. An inflection point at c comma f of c. One thing I should warn you about is this needs to be defined, right? To have an inflection point on the graph, you need to have the actual point. So f of c must <laughs> exist. You need a point on the graph where the, where the concavity changed. So I hope that makes sense. You have to be able to plug in that point into the original. Let's look at this abstract example. So if I'm considering my tangent lines, it looks like I'm concave up here, and it looks like I'm concave up until right about here. And it takes some practice to eyeball this, but if you see where I sectioned it off, this kind of has a cupping motion like this. And as soon as you get to about here, it then flips to downward. So I would say right here, approximately. I don't know exactly what that is. But here, x equals c, there's an inflection point here. We're defined, and we have this, this point, c comma f of c, if I were to call this function f of x. So that's what I'm looking for, I'm looking for that spot where you can see that cupping switch. And that's what an inflection point is. So in our previous example, the one where I actually used um, a function over here, we have 
0 comma what is the inflection point? Well, if you go back to the original, plug it in on the original graph, plug in 0, you get 1. So 0 comma 1 is an inflection point. It's just another feature of the graph, just like how we had a maximum or a minimum. You plug it back into the original to find the actual maximum, local max or local min. OK, let's look at another involved example now. So we're going to sketch the graph of this equation using the first and the second derivative. So we're going to use a, a bit of information from the previous lecture and also this one as well. So using the first and second derivatives, I better find those. So my first derivative is going to be 4x cubed minus um, 4. So 4x um, plus nothing. So this is my first derivative. If I go ahead and look for the critical numbers, so let's find the critical points. Those are important. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the derivative equal to 0. And this will mean I'll have 4x cubed minus 4x equals 0. I can factor out 4x. So that means 0 equals 4x x squared minus 1. And if I factor this difference of squares, I get x minus 1, x plus 1. So my critical numbers, critical points here, are x equals 0 for this one, and then plus and minus 1 as well. I would also check where f prime of x is undefined, but it's always defined. So I don't get any additional critical points from asking the question whether f prime of x is defined or not. So these are my critical points. I'm going to go ahead and write down this interval here, and I'm going to split it up into four different sections based on the three critical points I got. And we're going to test, we're going to use f prime of x to test here. So I could test a number like 2, for example, in the first derivative. I could test a half. I could test negative a half. And I could test negative 2. Remember, you're going to test these in the first derivative. So I think the easiest place to do that would be the factored form. You just have to worry about the signs of things. So if you test 2, for example, if I plug 2 into the first derivative, I get positive 8, positive 1, positive 3. So they're all positive. This means this interval is positive. What you'll see when you plug in all the other ones is this one is negative, this one is positive, this one's negative. And if you remember me talking about this in class, that's because the powers of all of these factors are odd. So when you find one of these intervals, the sign just keeps flipping. OK, so what does that mean? It means that, let me use a different color now. It means that on this first interval here, the graph is decreasing. Because that's what the first derivative tells you. On this interval, it's increasing. On this interval, it's decreasing. And on this interval, it's increasing. And note, we have a polynomial. So our domain is all real numbers. So we don't have to worry about anything odd happening here. OK? So we have this right here. What I could look for now is the second derivative. So let's do that over here. This already gave us a good bit of information, but we probably want to get the second derivative as well. So that'll be 12x squared minus 4. I'm interested in when that is positive and negative. So let's set this equal to 0 and try to solve this. So this is going to tell me that I have x squared equals 4 over 12, which is 1 over 3. So x equals plus or minus 1 over radical 3. Let's do another test here to test for the signs. Here it is going to be negative 1 over radical 3. And this is going to be positive 1 over radical 3. So these are the two spots now where the second derivative was 0. And then the numbers I'll test, I'll circle, so I'll, I'll test 0. 1 over radical 3 is like 1 over 1.7-ish. 1 so something that's certainly bigger would be something like 2. 
If you're not sure, just pick a, a very large number. For here, I could pick negative 2. That would fall in this interval. And we're going to test in the second derivative. So we're going to use f double prime to test. So if I do that, um, this version is easy enough, I suppose. So I could use that. So if I plug in a positive 2, you'll see that this is um, 48 minus 4 is 44, positive. Plugging in negative 2 gives you the same result, because you, you square here. If you plug in 0, you get a negative number. So what this tells us, since this is the second derivative, is this is concave up. This is concave down. And this is concave up. So now we have a lot of information. I'm going to go ahead and list a bunch of things that I just found. So notice on this increasing, decreasing graph here for the f prime, it looks like we're decreasing, then increasing, then decreasing, and then in, uh, increasing. I think I've, oh, let's see, decreasing, increasing, decreasing, increasing. So you can draw over this graph that I have here. And what you'll see is that we have the following. We have a local, um, we have a local max, and this is going to be where we go from increasing to decreasing. So that's at zero. So we have a local max at zero comma, and then you can go to the original equation to find that. So plug in zero into the original here, and you get three. We have local mins. Here we go from decreasing to increasing, which is a minimum. So that's at negative 1. So that's at negative 1, 2, if you plug that into the original. And then the other one is at here, you've got, got 1 here. You're decreasing and then increasing again. So this is 1, comma, and this is 2. You plug in 1, you also get 2. So that's helpful. We also go from concave up to concave down, and then again concave down to concave up. So these two are inflection points. So I'm going to say we have inflection points at x equals 1 over root 3 and negative 1 over root 3, so at those two x values. So now we have quite a bit of information. We can go ahead and plot some points now and get the shape of this graph. So I know I have the point 0, 3. I know I have the point negative 1, 2. And I also have the point 1, 2. I know that at 0, 3, it's a local max. And then I know um, these are supposed to be local mins. So what's going to happen here is we're going to have a change in concavity around 1 over root 3, which is roughly, um, maybe I should draw this a little bigger. So give me just a second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw the x-coordinates a little larger here, like more spaced out. So let's go ahead and draw right here. I'll do 1, 2, just really give us some space here. So again, I have the point. 0, 3. I have the point negative 1, 2. I have negative 1, or po positive 1, 2. 1 over root 3, mm, that's going to be 1 over about 1.7. So I'll put this somewhere here. So I'll call this 1 over root 3. And I'll call this one minus 1 over root 3. So here's what our graph is going to look like. We have this goes down. Um, it's concave down from 0 to negative 1 over root 3. So I'm going to make sure that it, the graph is facing downward like this up until that point. And then after that, it flips to concave upward on either side. So it's going to look like this. It'll then switch and go like this. And then this one will switch and go like this. So we have a nice smooth um, transition here. 
and this is a local max and these are local mins. The tails both go up this way forever because we have a positive x to the fourth. So when it's even, the tails both go the same direction up. OK, um, I hope that was a helpful example to show you um, how all these different um, things work together to make the picture of the graph. We're going to do some more examples in the next part of this video, so see you soon. OK, welcome back. So now we're going to talk about the second derivative test. So um, with the following three parts. So if the derivative at c equals 0 and f double prime of c is greater than 0 and c is a, mm, I'll put it at the start here. So if these two things are true, if f prime of c is 0 and f double prime of c is 0, and I'm going to remind you that c is a critical point. So um, you would know that because right here, the first derivative of c gives you 0. So that's a way to get a critical point. So we have c is some critical point. The, double, the second derivative is positive. That means that f has a local min at x equals c. OK, and if we reverse this, so if we have f prime of c is 0 and the second derivative of c is negative, that means f has a local max at x equals c. And then the third thing is if we have a critical point, f prime of c equals 0 here, and f double prime of c equals 0, the test, this test here, the second derivative test, tells us nothing. And in this case, it might be a good idea to go look to other tests or other features of the graph, do something else, uh, because this wouldn't tell you anything. All right, we're going to work through this last graphing example. So we're going to sketch the graph of f of x equals x times radical x plus 3, which is the same thing as x times radical, or x times x plus 3 to the 1 half power. That's how I usually write it. Okay, so let's compute the first derivative of f of x. So f prime of x is. The derivative of the first is just 1, so I'm just going to rewrite x plus 3 to the 1 half. Plus, I'm going to leave x alone here. And the derivative of the second is 1 half x plus 3 to the negative 1 half. And then times x is the x here that I've left alone. So here's my first derivative. I would like to know when this is positive, when this is negative. So let's factor. So this means that this is equal to. Both terms have the x plus 3 in common. And the smallest power is the negative 1 half. So I'm going to factor that out. 1 half minus a negative 1 half is the first power. Here I have plus 1 half x, because I've factored out this piece here. So if I set this equal to 0, and I move this to the denominator, I'm going to see that I have um, x plus half x is 3 halves x plus 3 over, and then this would be over the square root of x plus 3 equals 0. So how will this equal 0? Well, a fraction equals 0 when the numerator equals 0. So this means that the numerator should be equal to 0. And if we solve for this, we see that we have 3 halves x equals negative 3. And we're just going to get x equals negative 2. So this is one of our critical points. Is there an x value where the derivative goes undefined? There is. Um, at negative 3, that's also in the domain of the original. So consider the original, the domain of f of x. It's all those x that's greater than or equal to negative 3, because that's what you can plug into the square root. So negative 3 is in the domain. However, it's not in the domain of the derivative. So another critical point, so x equals negative 3, is another critical point. 
All right, I'm ready to find out where we're increasing and decreasing. So I'm going to have this negative 3 here because it's included in the domain, but none of this over here matters because it's not in the domain of the original. Then I'm going to also place negative 2 in here as well. And we're going to test two numbers. I'm going to test 0. And I'll test something like negative 2.5 as well. We're testing this in the first derivative. So the easiest version of that, hmm, that might be over here, or I've written it right here. So if you plug in 0, you get a positive over a positive. So this is a positive number, and we're increasing. If you test net something like negative 2.5, in the denominator, you still have a positive. Here, you would get a negative. So we're decreasing on just this interval from negative 3 to negative 2. So maybe I should summarize that. So we're decreasing from negative 3 to negative 2, and we're increasing from negative 2 to infinity. So that's what we have so far. What I could do from here is I can go ahead and take the next derivative, the, um, the second derivative, and that'll tell us some more about um, the shape of this graph. So let's go ahead and try to do that. So here I'm going to have, um, I think I'll go over here where I have some space. So let's rewrite this. Um, so let's take this here. Um, we'll do the product rule, actually, on the first derivative. So here's my first derivative. We're going to do the product rule. This will be my second derivative. So I'm going to rewrite the first one. That's x plus 3 to the negative 1 half. Derivative of the second one here, I get 1 plus a half. These, these are the only two things that contribute. So I get 1 plus a half. So the derivative of that is just 3 halves. Plus, let's switch the order now. So derivative of the first one is negative 1 half x plus 3 to the negative 3 halves. So that's the derivative of the first one. We're going to leave the second one alone. And I'm going to combine those like terms again. So this is 3 over 2 x plus 3. I would like to know when this is positive and negative. So I'm going to work on this a little bit just to, to figure that out. So if I'm looking at this, what do I see that's in common? I see that the x plus 3 to the negative 3 halves is in common. That's the smallest power of it. So we have negative 1 half minus 3 halves is x plus 3 to the positive 1. I'm going to multiply by this 3 halves. Then I have a minus sign from this minus 1 half. I have 1 half. I have factored out the x plus 3 to the negative 1 half here, so that's gone. And I have this, 3 halves x plus 3. OK, so that's factored. I would like to set this equal to 0, but first let me keep working on it just a little while longer. So this is going to be, um, if I distribute this here and then move this to the denominator, I'm going to get 3 halves x plus 9 over 2 minus 3 over 4x minus 3 over 2 all over x plus 3 to the 3 halves power. So I'd like to know when this is equal to 0. So I'm going to keep going here. If I combine 3 halves x and 3 fourths x, I'm going to get 3 fourths x here, this minus this. And then if I combine these two, I get 6 over 2, which is 3. This is all over x plus 3 to the 3 halves equals 0. And now I'd like to set the numerator equal to 0, because that's where this is going to equal 0. So I have 3 over 4 x plus 3 equals 0. So then 3 over 4 x equals negative 3, or x equals negative 4. OK, so let's go ahead and consider this. Again, I'm only going to start from 
negative 3 here, because that's the domain of the original, you won't have any, um, anything to do with concavity for the other part, because it's not even defined over here. Notice the x value I got was negative 4, which is out here. So I don't even need to test around that, because the domain is actually negative 3 and everything larger. So there's only one interval to test. You get to pick whatever number you want, basically, that's larger than negative 3. I'm going to choose 0 because it's easy. And you're going to test this in the second derivative. So where's an easier version of my second derivative? Probably this is the easiest thing to deal with. Um, so if you plug in 0 here, you get a positive number over a positive number. So this is the second derivative I tested. So what did I just figure out? I figured out that we're concave upward from negative 3 to infinity. So for the entire graph, the whole thing is concave upward. And we've seen graphs like that before, right? Like the parabola, standard parabola is always concave up. So we just showed that this is always concave upward. And now let me go ahead and draw the graph. Now that we know all this information, we know increasing, decreasing. Um, we know that when we go from decreasing to increasing, right here at negative 2, we have a local min at negative 2. Is the original function easy enough for me to plug that in? Let's see. So if you plug in negative 2, you get negative 2 times 1, which is negative 2. So we know we have a local min at negative 2, negative 2, because it goes from decreasing to increasing over here. All right, let's graph the thing. So um, at negative 2, negative 2, I have a local min. I know I'm concave up the entire time, so it's going to be this shape. Notice if you plug in 0, f of 0 is just 0. So I have the point 0, 0. And then notice if you also plug in negative 3, you get 0 as well. And this is where the graph ends on the left side. You can't plug in anything to the left of negative 3. So the graph looks something like this. It's always concave upward. And it looks just like that. There's one local minimum here. OK, I hope that helped with, um, with more practice with concavity. The derivative was a little more complicated, but this is the process you should follow, um, especially this factoring step that I did here um, to find all the zeros. Let's look at this last thing here. So this is, we're going to say this is the uh, graph of f of x. So what I want to review something here. So we're going to say, or we're going to ask the following question. So where is f double prime of x positive? What does that mean? So if I'm looking at an original graph, graph what does it mean for it to be positive? What that means is you should be thinking, where is f of x, the original, concave up? Those are the, those are the same thing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to section those off with this pink marker. So here you're concave down because the tangent lines are above the curve. But once you get to about here, I would say, just like right there, all the tangent lines start to be below the graph. This one, and this one, and this one. So here I'm going to section off this piece right here. On this interval, we're concave up. So on this interval, f double prime is positive. The others flip back to being um, concave down again, if you notice. What if you were given the derivative to begin with? The same question. Where is f double prime positive? Positive. Well, that's the question. Where is the slope of f prime of x positive? So the second derivative is the derivative of the derivative, right? So I want the slope of this graph. So I'm asking the question here if I want the, derivative, the second derivative to be positive, where is the slope of this one positive? So if you imagine you're walking from left to right, where are you walking uphill? That's where the slope is positive. So here's a section where you have to walk uphill. 
And then you're going down here, and then where are you increasing again? Right here. So you start increasing again from here to infinity. So it goes up like this. So in this section and in this section, the slope of this graph is positive. So on these two sections, you have f double prime is positive. So be careful what you're given. If you're given f or you're given f prime, um, to find the places where f double prime is positive, it's a different question for each of them. But I hope I've cleared that up. All right, thank you so much for watching and sticking with me here. Um, please go try your lecture quiz. And as usual, send me questions if you get stuck at all. I will see you next time. Bye.